I like so much the notion of superposition because I think, I will try to put it in very simple terms, but it's a more complex theory, uh, a, a, a guy who teaches, French guy who I think, what, what, is he Stanford or Santa Cruz? Uh, did you hear the name Jean-Pierre Dupuy? D-U-P-U-Y. A yeah. French theorist. Vaguely familiar, but not yeah. an expert, yeah. Who, uh, 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 tried to introduce, but without any bluffing about quantum physics, the notion of superposition into historical processes and knowledges. I will give you an extremely simplified example. Let's say today we are in an, I will go even specifically, Russia, Putin, Ukraine war. Again, maybe it's already decided in the terms of uh, the Schrodinger equation, 99%, but we don't know what, that there will be global war or not. But his idea is this one. And again, this is pure speculation more pertaining to human language. Is that in our human, uh, human universe, uh, I'm here often refer, maybe refer to that famous quote from T.S. Eliot, who was an idealist, a conservative, but nonetheless, he put it nicely that every new invention, really new in art, in some sense also changes the entire past. It makes it readable in a different way. So Dupuy's interpretation against these lines would be, let's say that in two, three years, there will be World War III. Then automatically, we will retroactively read it as, it was clear all the time that this should happen, we just had illusions that it, we can avoid it. Let's say that World War III will not happen, then we will act the way we read today uh, 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 the Cold War. No? Yes, it was danger, but somehow we avoided it, and so on and so on. But uh, the first point that I like is that it's not enough to say that these were just different possibilities, options. No, it's a stronger term. It's in the sense that if something happens, it, of course, it doesn't restructure the past in its brutal reality. But the whole symbolic constellation of how we read the past changes. And this now, I could go on here for hours. I love these examples. That's why I am not, and I think in my crazy way, I got this lesson from quantum physics, mechanics, uh, I am not, uh, 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 I totally reject this stupid historicist view to understand Shakespeare. You must study in detail Elizabethan era and so on. I would say first the opposite. To understand Elizabethan era, read Shakespeare. You will learn more. But more seriously, you know, for me, really great works of art are precisely the ones which cannot be limited to a specific historical constellation. Every new epoch reinvents them. For example, with Shakespeare. Many people don't know, but immediately after his death, it was the horrible era of Racine and all those strange guys, classicists, and Shakespeare was considered vulgar. Only through Romanticism, Shakespeare was reinvented. And I love these paradoxes, how sometimes, precisely not knowing all the context of Shakespeare, historical, you can propose a reading which is much more convincing. And it's not simply an external reading. Again, I'm back to my point about openness. It is as if, which is obvious, Shakespeare didn't really know what he is doing. You know, which is here my wonderful example. You know that it's attributed to Lincoln, but I read somewhere that he did, it was not really the first to say that, you know, you can cheat some of the people all the time, all the people sometimes, but you cannot cheat all the people all of the time. This is a deeply ambiguous statement. It can mean there are some idiots who can be cheated all the time, 
some the same, or it can mean in one situation I will be the idiot, in another situation you or you. You see, this is for me how language is structured. It is open. The author himself is not a possessor of some hidden meaning. That's why my favorite example is, you know, where Shakespeare. For me, the best uh, cinema version of Shakespeare, uh, Hamlet, is Kurosada in 62 in Japan, did a version of Hamlet with a wonderful title, Only Evil People Sleep Good, which is a deep truth, you know. Real evil people don't care. They don't, they are not haunted by God, you know. And uh, again, it's set in modern Japan. Hamlet is a student returns to Tokyo from the United. But what I'm saying is, you see what I'm aiming at? This, I, or I'll give you another classical example. I remember from Dupuy this quote. You are too young, call to be. Some 20, 30 years ago, there was a presidential candidate in France, Edouard Balladur, who failed. But when there were some three elections in Le Monde, there was a wonderful comment saying, if Balladur will win next election, his victory will be necessary. You know the paradox. After something happens, it becomes retroactively necessary. And uh, now you see where I am aiming at. I'm desperately looking, but you almost converted me. I will have to work more in quantum physics for some kind of ontological foundation of this openness. That, mm, that good. I like this idea of retroactive determinism. And I will give you the ultimate social proof. This is not physics at all, but I love it. Uh, 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 Protestantism. People don't notice this obvious paradox. Weber, Protestant ethics, origin of capitalism, blah, blah. But since, if anything, capitalism is a system which pushes you to constant effort and so on, isn't it strange that you would have then expected that capitalism, sorry, Protestantism would have been against, uh, and this brings me back to your point in a very nice way, that capitalism would have been against predetermination. Because if everything is predetermined, why not my sit at home, masturbate, and watch Pornhub or whatever? It's already decided. But precisely capitalism, we, which is the most active system, needs predestination. Along what lines? Along what you said. Here I come back to you. Here I will use you. When you said wonderfully, yes, Schrodinger equation objectively valid, but with one small point, I don't know where I am in it. And that's Protestantism in religion. You see now what I am aiming at, you know. But uh, nonetheless, you know, let's go to the end in metaphysics. Uh, uh, I see your point, but then what would be your answer to where does then our limitation now I'm going back to you. There is an objective description we can give it. We just don't know where we are. You don't think that how can how can many worlds interpretation account for this uniqueness of us? Not uniqueness in any metaphysical sense, but how we are one unique, but still can arrived at this objective, as it were, view of Good. this is something. So let me say two things. From One me. is How a little do you bit account for the subject itself, himself, himself. I will not go into this bullshit now. So I'm, I'm happy we can solve these questions so easily in this podcast. It'll be very, very valuable to future generations. <laughs> um, <laughs> I'll say I'll say two things. One a little bit negative, and one more constructive. That the negative thing is. I am reluctant to think about quantum mechanics when I think about the uncertainty of human history, because there is a difference between quantum mechanics and probability or stochasticness, right? There's plenty of room for unpredictability in the world in addition to what 
quantum mechanics gives us. What's special about quantum mechanics is that there's not just the probability. The probability is derived from this thing called the wave function, which distinguishes the idea that there's two possibilities, but we don't know which one is true, from the idea that there's really both possibilities at once. And I think that at least when it comes to human subjectivity and history, you don't need to imagine that all the possibilities are simultaneously physically true. You can just work with the fact that there's so much uncertainty and, excuse me, unpredictability in the real world that we need a language of probability and computation and information to really make progress on these things. And it might involve the past in an intricate way. In fact, I will, I'll reveal, I'll, I'll mention two funny things. One is I recently did a podcast with Katie Elliott, who's a philosopher, and she made very much a similar point that you're making about Protestantism. She, she, we were talking about predestination and eternalism. And she said that she can make uh, eternalist, what she convinced herself that Calvinism was okay. <laughs> I'm not because a it, theory. It's no longer Luther. It's Calvinism, which is elevated. Calvinism, in, right. Yeah, yeah. You know, the, the problem with Calvinism is, you know, you're either blessed and going to go to heaven or you're not. But you never you don't know. know. You never know. But you never know. So the worry, she points out, is, is very well known, is that, well, I can just act bad because I'm predestined to go to heaven or not. But what you don't understand is that God knows that you're going to act bad. And so if you act bad, you're bringing to reality the possibility that you're not going to go to heaven. So even though it is predestined because you don't know, it is still in your best interest to act good. Yeah. Uh, no, no. <laughs> that I will don't align you. Is, I forgot his name. Uh, uh, my God, I forgot his name. And uh, 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 Protestant, okay, back to whatever. Uh, the, uh, theorist? Uh, theologist who is also known as the one who uses analytic philosophy and he he precisely in the terms of beyond the speed of light he defended protestantism because he said exactly what you said now that uh, like if i'm predestined how uh, uh, why should i act good and so on but again god is beyond time god knows how you will decide exactly no that's why right. it's that like is... it's like Newcomb's paradox. That's how we got into it. Yes, it's it's if you if you believe that there are oracles that know about the future, you will behave differently than if than if you don't. Yeah, but, but again... anyway, the other thing I wanted to say, I I wrote a short piece, a short essay that I published on my blog years ago, called "I hope you'll be amused by this." The universe is structured like a language. So somehow for me, I am a universe, not unconscious, but universe. Not the unconscious. The universe is structured like a language. So I quote you and I quote some quantum physicists. And the basic idea is that the universe evolves from a very orderly, low entropy, early state to very disorderly, messy future state. Along the way, complex structures appear. Right. This is the kind of thing that at the Santa Fe Institute we're very interested in understanding. And the implication is that there, somewhere there in the laws of physics, in the laws of dynamics, in the way that we think about how the universe marches forward, there exists the potential, the potentiality for interesting complex things to happen. And even though they were not sort of embedded intrinsically in the initial conditions, they came to be because of the structure of the dynamics along the way. And maybe quantum mechanics does play a role in that. Um, that's This is all stuff that nobody claims to understand very, very well. But if there are, you know, if there's something computational or useful about complex structures coming into existence, then that would be very nice to understand. And by the way, by complex structures, I include you and me, right? Why did living beings come into existence, even though the second law of thermodynamics says that the universe just rolls down to more and more disorder? And the, the suggested answer is that the way that you get to more and more disorder is to pass through intricate, complicated things. And you can't predict very well which one they're going to be.